Are you still with me? Next, we'll have a critical conversation about black maternal health. Our panelists will discuss the birthing justice movement and reshaping policies, practices, perspectives to guarantee dignified and respectful care for every birthing individual. Here to moderate this distinguished panel is Dr. Joya Creer Perry. Is it on? Test my mic sounds nice. Check one. You know, I always want to be a hip hop artist. Y'all here? We here? Okay. Listen, Puerto Rico. I'm excited. Um, so uh, we are here at this wonderful occasion. And truthfully, as a person who's from the deep south, as a black woman who's eight, at least eight generations being stolen from the continent of Africa, I'm excited to come to the diaspora to see what black and brown love could look like. And when we talk about black maternal health, we sometimes leave out. The fact that blackness is a global concept. It is not something that was created in the United States of America. So, so excited to be here in Puerto Rico to really have this important conversation with you all. I am an OBGYN by training. I call myself a dissident OBGYN. I've been running from it since I did it. Um, <laughs> I'm the founder and president of the National Birth Equity Collaborative. My organization is now about eight years old. I mean, since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, we've been through a lot. So I need y'all to pray for us today because it's been wild out here in these streets, right? People love me and love the organization. We only talked about maternal health and didn't tie the fact that maternal health also means infertility. Maternal health also means abortion. Maternal health also means the entire African diaspora. Maternal health is not a concept that's confined to a hospital or a physician or even a high risk OBGYN as who was leading the projects beforehand. So I am so honored to be on this panel to moderate this conversation around the importance of maternal health across our lived experiences as people of color, as black women, as black birthing people, of people who've come to this world and to this continent, really um, acknowledging that this is both a social determinant of health, it's a political determinant of health, but truthfully, I am feeling this really deeply right now. It's a spiritual determinant of health. If our spirits are not aligned, if we don't really show up about who we are as individuals, this will never work. Be clear. So be clear. We can do some ashes and burn some sage until we actually figure out what our true indigenous roots are. We will never fix black maternal health. That's just a fact. OK, so with that being said, I want to just start off by letting my amazing panelists kind of talk about what brought them to this work. As I mentioned, I'm an OBGYN. I had three specific birth stories. My first daughter was born when I was in college. Um, so, you know, I might as well have been 12 to my parents because when you are 21 in a, in a black middle-class family and trying to talk about having a baby when you have no job, I might as well have been 12, right? So I had that experience. I also had a child who was born who weighed less than a pound. And that's really the founding of my organization because as a person who's a child of a physician and a pharmacist, to have a baby that was so small and so early, it, was, it didn't make sense. There was no logic. My only risk factor was having black skin. And there's nothing, There's my black skin is popping. So it didn't make any biological sense that I would have a one, <laughs> thank you. It didn't make any biological sense that I would have a one pound baby. And I was taught at my medical school at Louisiana State University, a publicly funded medical school that my state pays a lot of, the black folks who live in that state pay a lot of money for taxes, I was taught that there were three biological races, mongoloid, caucasoid, and negroid. This is the 1990s. So that means many physicians and nurses who are my age, who were trained at the Louisiana State University, still believe the reason we have poor health outcomes is because there's a biological basis of race. So that's really the beginning of my origin story. And then my last child, who's 12 years old and taller than me now and has a little mustache, is driving me a little nuts, um, was born with utilizing a gestational carrier. So I'm the full reproductive spectrum, right? And so as most black women, we start things because we got a problem. We're trying to fix it for ourselves. We're like, y'all should come too. I got to fix my thing. Y'all might as well participate as well, right? So this is really how the journey begins for, begins for me. And so I want to start with my friend, the amazing sister midwife from New Orleans, baby. Listen, so tell us about that. <laughs> 
<laughs> and is this is this thing on? Right. Yes, it is on. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Joya. Um, so my name is Nicole Deggins. I am the founder and CVO of System It Wife Productions. I come to this work as a labor and delivery nurse, a postpartum nurse, a well baby nurse. I've worked in hospitals all across the country. I became a midwife in 1999 because I, I really thought that becoming a midwife was going to be the answer to fixing the ails that were a part of the birthing experience. I originally wanted to be an OBGYN, but quickly realized that that was not my path. And so I became a midwife, went to Emory University, did that thing. And as I traveled around the country working as a midwife and as a labor and delivery nurse primarily, I began to see that the system was flawed everywhere I went. It was flawed everywhere for everyone, regardless of race or socioeconomic status or the state that they were in. Contrary to popular belief, California wasn't any better because that's what everybody said. And so I began to create opportunities to educate my community and individuals about how to make birth better. Because what I realized was no matter how much even education people had about birth options, they still were being hoodwinked and bamboozled as they entered the hospital system. And so I started System at Wife Productions in 2011. Since then, we've done a lot of work um, around creating a Black doula and midwife directory, training doulas across the country and across the diaspora, I can say, um, and so much more. But I'll stop there and shift to my right. Is this on? Oh, it is. Yes, great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Redman, or you can call me KR. Um, prefer KR, um, unless I'm being printed in somebody's white journal or something. <laughs> um, so I am, let's talk about what brought me here, I guess. Um, a little bit different path. However, I too was in pre-med to be an OB. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Like ex-Catholics. No. Oh. <laughs> um, so... Yes. So um, actually, I shifted my journey a little bit to public health because of the systemic oppressions I was seeing just as a black queer person growing up and thinking about just what brought me here is really my political lineage. Um, I'm from L.A. My family are some of the founders of the Crips in L.A. And um, I say that willfully because historically um, the Crips are institutions or not even institutions, but groups like that were rooted out of the Black Panthers and were created specifically in L.A. to protect the Black family against the largest gang, which was the LAPD. So um, that's my political lineage. Oh, no, for sure. Um, that's my political lineage. Um, that's what brought me to organizing and really just thinking about um, where my identities exist within our communities, um, specifically around Black liberation. And as I went through my process of medical school, I realized that um, I can be a, a great physician, I can do all the work I can as an abolitionist to dismantle, disrupt, and rebuild systems that were not traditionally created for us um, and figure out how I exist within those uh, spaces, which is very important, but it wasn't something for me. Um, I wanted to actually do the groundwork as an organizer to truly just dismantle, disrupt systems from the outside. Um, and I figured out that path while moving from LA to Georgia and working with Spark Reproductive Justice now, which is in the house. Uh, we are queer Black, yes, uh, we are um, a queer Black and trans uh, reproductive justice organization that's doing some really great work throughout the Southeast. Um, and also a little bit about my personal experience. So I've had three birthing journeys. My first birthing journey, um, again, you know, what science says, I'm textbook, higher, you know, social economic status, blah, 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 you know, all these different things. Um, I gave birth to my first child, Amir, uh, who is now six years old, but he was one pound, 12 ounces, was born in- Twenties, we're twenties. Right, I know, I know. Um, and he spent four months in the NICU in the ways in which I had to show up as Dr. Redmond versus a parent in those situations and advocate for my child and not only the disparities with what happened to me, but also his potential um, outcomes of facing infant mortality and morbidities and things of that nature. And now, I mean, amazing child. Um, my second birthing experience um, in 2020 was pregnant gave birth to um, my child at 24 weeks, survived for four days and passed away. Um, and the end of 2020, became pregnant with my third child, um, my rainbow baby, so to speak, um, full term, no issues. Beautiful, but yes. the way in which I took power and ownership over my experience was quite different than everything else. I, um, despite what physicians said, even 
black physicians telling me you don't you shouldn't listen to your body All skin you can folk never get folk. no yes um and etc um you know i i took matters into my own hands and just um surrounded myself with people that had the same vision for what i wanted with my body and such and um birth the perfectly healthy baby araya who's at home with her brother and not here um, so <laughs> that's okay thank you so much for sharing it. and so i would love so although i'm from new orleans i currently live in the dmv and so my brilliant friend <laughs> so my brilliant friend here can dr harris can you please share with us your or like how you came into this work because i know you have a whole like i met you in a prior to this exactly <laughs> so to tell the people about yourself hello hello can you hear me um good afternoon so happy to be here yeah so how i came into this work um been in this work a long time i am almost i've almost been a doula for 20 years now i started at university of michigan um studying maternal health and epidemiology and didn't know that these issues that i was studying even though I would hear things about socioeconomic status, you would see the birth outcomes where teen mothers were doing so much better than professional women and their birth outcomes. I really didn't believe it actually when I was studying and I was very kind of resistant against this knowledge. And um, unbeknownst to me, I ended up getting pregnant with twins um, and unfortunately lost those twins at 32 weeks. And so then when that happened, I really was like, oh my God, this is real. This is like real. It was almost as if I was the textbook version of what I had been learning in my PhD program. So that's kind of how I came to this space. Um, and then at the time, you know, this is almost 14 years ago that I had that experience. And at that time, we weren't really accepting as a Black community also the statistics around social determinants of health, but also socioeconomic status, education. We weren't ready to really accept that. We were kind of in a place back then of, well, if you eat right, if you do the right things, if you see a midwife, you know, if you, you know, if you take the natural route, then these things won't happen to you. And so I was isolated for a while until we really all came to the same conclusion and we were like, wait, this happened to you? Wait, this happened to you too? And so um, with that, I really just worked to, similar to my sisters here, comrades, educating about not being blindsided, making sure we know way ahead of the time before we get pregnant. We often don't start reading about pregnancy until we get pregnant, which is, which is an issue right there. Um, right, right now, my current work is working as a senior director of maternal health for Black Women's Health Imperative. So yeah, we're 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 heading to our 40th year anniversary, really standing on on the shoulders of folks like Joya and um, Dr. Billy Avery and some of my um, colleagues that are also in the audience in terms of really educating, um, invigorating that village, invigorating that knowledge about birth. Um, because we do have the answers. We are our own solutions and just making sure that we get that knowledge out there. So I'll stop there. That was perfect. Thank you, Dr. Harris, Dr. Kanika. Um, and, you know, I want y'all to be thinking about questions because we're going to leave room for audience questions. We're going to have a brief conversation up here, but before my last and final, so we had it. So the, I love the state of Black Health. The last time y'all were in New Orleans. So of course we had a good time. Who, who was in New Orleans? Yes. We, did y'all party like rock stars or no? Y'all just worked all the time. Boo, y'all. We got to come back and have fun. We cannot come to New Orleans and not have fun. What's the point, right? So, yes. Um, but when we had the prep call, what I love about my, my colleague to my right is that we talked about how we don't talk about Afro-Latina health. Like, I, I give this data point. It's like a random, it's the only data point we have in the United States that when we looked at New York City Department of Health data, you've probably heard that Black people, Black women are 8 to 12 times more likely to die in childbirth right, than their white counterparts, despite income or education. If you have not heard it, hear this, right? In New York City, Black people who are pregnant are eight to 12 times more likely to die within a year of having a baby than their white counterparts, despite income or education. So I would say that quote all the time, but the only point I could talk about for Afro-Latinas was that within the Latina community, Puerto Ricans 
had the worst outcomes. They finally, within the New York City Health Department, disaggregated the data, not just by lumping all Asians to people together and lumping all Latinas together. They actually disaggregated by where you're from. And it turns out when you're from Puerto Rico, you know, I, I can, you are less likely to survive childbirth in the city of New York. So think about all the ways colorism shows up, right? Think about all the reasons that might would be, um, and even immigration status, like we could make a whole, I'm sure AOC and Cardi B could have a whole conversation about this right now, right? So just why, and I would love to think about here now that we're here, how the state of black health can really re reimagine what our relationship is with the Afro-Latino world. So if you don't mind talking about your origin story and then we'll move from there. Thank you, Mila. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate being invited to share with you today. Um, I really think I come um, to this space as, a, as an advocate, as an organizer, as a Caribbean woman. I'm Dominican born and raised, but then I also ra was raised in New York a couple of years and I've been living in Puerto Rico for more than 20. So I have that experience of being a migrant and your body being somewhere, your heart being somewhere, your mind being somewhere else. And then trying to um, just put that together in a wholesome way. Um, so I come here also through my personal story, as you all have said, um, making decisions about my reproductive life um, and my family story, also the woman in my family. Um, I have seven brothers and sisters and more aunts that you can count as all of you. Um, you can share also that uh, matriarchal part of our lives, right? And our presence of the woman in our lives. Um, and this morning I was thinking while I was hearing you all, um, our wonderful speaker, um, keynote speaker talked about um, sharing history and coming out of the basement and what that got to do with public health. And I think was part as I got to public health because it was an afterthought. Um, and because living in Puerto Rico uh, and feeling Puerto Rican and um, embracing Puerto Rican culture, um, we know about systematic oppression and we know about colonialism and boy, we know about body disfranchisement because we don't forget our history. We don't forget um, um, all the stories that have been um, surrounding Puerto Rican women in the past 60 to 80 years. Um, and I just wanted to bring that um, to the space. But we also know um, and share, um, I think a uh, deep carrying muscle, maybe, um, for well being in our communities and for finding our strengths and just showing up, even though you didn't know that you were going to show up to this fight. Um, but we are here and I'm happy to share it with you all. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And you know, what you reminded me of is that the work that we get to do, many, many things that we get to do, some of that um, with funding through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we looked at how hospitals think of women, we're all women sitting here, as lost leaders. Y'all know what that term means, lost leader? So basically, um, we underfund the care of women, be it hysterectomies, be it delivery. And when you're in the meetings with the hospital CEOs, they'll say, oh, well, women's health is a lost leader because we don't care that we lose money on hysterectomies or labor and delivery because women make decisions for the household. So they will bring their husbands for knee surgery and they will bring their fathers for heart surgery. So it doesn't matter that we lose money on the care of women because the hospital still makes money because we make the decisions for the household. Who, who's, whose house is like that? Exactly. Okay, so, they, so they're using the fact that this is a fact to actually generate income, Sorry. but what does that do for our care? What does that do to how we actually get to survive, much less thrive inside of a system that sees us as a lost leader? So with that being said, I would love to go back around again, just have our colleagues to talk about the solutions that they've created within their organizations 
and how we are pushing back against the narrative that our only value is to be a lost leader for a healthcare system. So if you don't mind, Nicole talked about your work. Yes. You can start. Okay. Oh, I I was not going to start with your question. I can. <laughs> um, but what I wanted to add to the conversation, yes. as we're in this room and, you know, sitting on the panel, I really want to discuss um, the erasure of people. I want to Center the fact that this conversation is not centering cis women. This conversation should and will continue to be inclusive of all folks, um, queer, trans, gender expansive, et cetera, and such. Because as you know, when it comes to birthing justice and reproductive justice, we have to center those within the furthest relationships to power. Um, and so we always speak about blackness and black folks, but we don't think about the communities that exist within our blackness and such. And if we have a shared understanding of the only way to get to freedom and liberation and reproductive justice and birthing justice and et cetera Speak, is black ahead. liberation, which is essential to queer and trans liberation. It's all in one. Then we can kind of get further together as a people and across different movements and such. So when we're speaking about even birthing justice, I want us, you know, when we talk about data and family structures and things like that, there's many ways families exist and they look different ways and such. Um, and especially folks who birth and such, we, you know, many different identities there. So I just want us to be mindful of that. No, stop. Not just on the so tell us more about your organization here. since you got the mic. Um, say that again. Tell us more about your work. Oh, yes. So um, Spark Reproductive Justice now um, holds that down um, to as well. One of the many organizations that holds down that work in the South. Um, Black Women Health Imperative is also now in Atlanta too as well. Um, and we're part of a um, In Our Own Voices, which is a national collective of um, Black reproductive justice organizations, as well as other different coalitions and movements and such. But some of the ways in which we work together collectively as a movement to shift kind of structure and, and the ways in which um, we uplift leadership within these systems is one, I would like to just um, hold space for how we build and shift power. Um, I think that as we work together collectively within our organizations, within our communities, within our cross movements, um, the ways in which we're intentional about collaborating and who we center and the work that we're doing helps us to essentially build and shift power, um, move collectively, mobilize people. Um, and the thought is, well, where are we mobilizing to, right? Um, you know, you can organize, you can mobilize folks, and then what, right? Um, and we're all in different walks as um, within our journey of liberation, right? Um, so if we, I think, as a cross-movement folks, can really um, focus on mobilizing people, but to shifting policy or mobilizing people to... Um, to, uh, well, I know everyone is not an abolitionist and such, so I'm trying to censor my language here um, because I'm like, just burn yeah, all this shit down. down. <laughs> you know, let's burn it all down and just figure it out, right? And such, but um, listen, start off <laughs> new. Um, so, um, but, but how can we kind of come together in spaces like this to really develop a collective strategy for how we move together um, and be it for shifting power in the political environment or shifting culture. Like just what I was saying around, you know, language and being mindful and in, in, um, not intentionally erasing folks and their experiences and such, that's a part of culture shift work. So I think that we have to decide what part of the movement we wanna take space in and then figure out how we can get there together. I love that. You know, we talk a lot about either being a reform. Thank you. So y'all can clap. She's awesome. <laughs> being an abolitionist or a reformist, right? So I, I often say the NBEC is a harm reduction organization. We ain't really abolishing nothing when you're working with like, I don't know, Johnson and Johnson. Like you're really just trying to reduce the harm. And then I have colleagues who are like, nah, sis, <laughs> forget Johnson and Johnson. <laughs> so, and I love that we need both. If we're going to win, we literally need both. We need people who are dreaming about what would it look like if we didn't have pharma controlling how much drugs cost, right? Like who's thinking about that? That's y'all, right? That's not me. I'm in there like, please, can y'all please just stop killing us? I just, as an OBGYN, I'm just like for y'all to stop, right? So we do, I love that you brought that up. And I and I don't wanna, so if whoever wants to talk about their work next, um, it doesn't have to be predicted or order. So anybody wanna hop in? Sure. Yes. Okay. 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 <laughs> Um, this is how we work together, sisterly. Um, so at Black Women's Health Imperative right now, we have a um, program called Nourish, 
um, which stands for New Opportunity to Uncover Our Resources, Intuition, Spirit, and Healing. And it's really focused on um, HBCU campuses off of my comrade, my sister, Jeanne Epps, who started, um, who works on My Sister's Keeper. And so we really wanted to expand that paradigm and that work to maternal health. So we work on HBCU campuses, um, making sure that they know the knowledge before they become pregnant, that they, we have where, you know, HHS, everyone's talking about preconception health and the importance of preconception health. However, it's really hard to translate preconception health to populations that aren't ready to have children. So the way we do that is through training them to be doulas, but also becoming their fertility doulas first, helping them understand what it looks like to take care of yourself, helping them understand, hey, if you don't want these fibroids to affect your reproduction later, let's talk about what they look like. Let's talk about how to talk to your OBGYNs right now. Let's talk about, um, let's actually show you what those surgeries look like. So you know, you can try and do the things that you need to do now. Let's talk about what it really feels like to be nourished. What does that spiritual determinants of health look like? We actually, they were yearning for ritual, for, for a collective sisterhood, for ways to reinvigorate and restart a village because our village looks different now. We're in the first generation of the no village generation, right? Which, which that means is that we have literally... Um, you know, our mothers aren't living as long. We're moving away. We've bought into this idea of diet, family structures, as we're talking about all these different family structures that we're going to now need to support our reproductive journeys and our birthing journeys. Because without that and without community that is looking so different now, because we've bought into this idea of we're supposed to get our education, we're supposed to start our careers, then we're supposed to have babies, right? So now we've done that. And what we're finding is our reproductive um, journeys are struggling. We're struggling in terms of having children. We're scared to have children. And um, we're just struggling to raise our children. You know, maternal mental health is a part of that too. So really through investing in HBCUs that are really like the heart of Black communities, Black leaders, um, invigorating change, really investing in that paradigm that we can start creating leaders that one can take care of themselves. Dr. Joya have just talked about um, how women, you know, we lead the health of our families and our communities. How do we learn that for ourselves? How do we reinvigorate community for ourselves? And then how do we take that knowledge into our practices as nurses, as midwives, as OBGYNs as well? So this is like really starting to replant a new seed, fertilize a new seed for the development of just birth justice, birth joy, and just the health of our community. So that's what I'm really working to do through Nourish at BWHI, as well as um, working on a documentary that really focuses on the healing around our stories and you know how complicated they are, but they don't stop with the trauma. We have to talk about the healing and how we get to the other side. And so that documentary is called Listen to Me. So that's what I, we're working I would on. love to follow this. This is such a perfect segue into some of the work that we're doing. First, um, the tagline at System at Wife Productions is birth is the revolution. And if we revolt, that is to rise up against the status quo and shift the way we think about pregnancy, conception, birth, parenting, and the postpartum period, we could literally change the vibration of our communities. Mm -hmm. I say it all the time. It is everywhere that I go because I really believe that. So one time someone challenged me and they were like, but you're talking about birth. And I'm like, but see, what you don't understand is that preconception and interconception is a part of birth. Postpartum is a part of birth. And there is a continuum that I like to talk about from conscious conception to conscious parenting. And so this program is so beautiful for me and to hear about it because so often we are missing this piece of preconception care and we are missing this concept that we must be educated and connected to our reproductive selves, to our wounds, to our experiences, to who we are as individuals well before we are pregnant well before we are pregnant because once we are pregnant you blink your eyes and the conversation is over mm -hmm. I give thanks that I already had the information that I knew about pregnancy and parenting when I was pregnant with my daughter because I was overwhelmed 
overwhelmed with how to choose the right pack and play. And I thought to myself, thank God, I know I'm going to have a home birth. Thank God, I know I'm going to breastfeed. Thank God, I already know how this thing is going to play out. It did not play out how I planned. We were in the NICU for seven days, born at 35 weeks, um, because birth has its own way of doing things, right? But, but I already knew those things, and so I didn't have to go down the road of reading these different books and figuring things out. And I also knew that I wanted to center joy. I knew that centering joy was important. One of the things that has happened, like we, I am grateful that we have an elevation of the information around Black maternal health and maternal health outcomes. It's a good thing that we are now becoming more aware. However, on the flip side of it, now we have people literally walking around in fear, in fear about pregnancy. And that is problematic for me because I understand that there is joy in Black birth. So one of the things that we do in addition to training doulas is we have this thing called the art of birthing. You'll see the cards that someone was passing around, placing on tables. And the whole purpose of that event is to center Black birthing joy. I'm from New Orleans, as I, Joy had mentioned earlier. And in New Orleans, we like good party, good food, and good fun. And so... <laughs> No matter how much we are educating people in New Orleans, if you are not connecting it to fun, they're not listening and they're not showing up. And so everywhere I would go, it started in um, September, which is Infant Mortality Awareness Month. I was always talking about dead babies and sick mamas. Didn't nobody want to keep talking about that. So I had to figure out a way to bring information into my community so that they would listen and hear and pay attention. And so through poetry, through visual art, through a play that we produce, through um, singing and voice things, through a birth justice documentary, we have a birth justice film festival, we would have these conversations and we show the documentaries and we have panels. And so it was a way to really shift the conversation around birth, but also to bring awareness. And another thing I wanna to touch on really quickly is this thing of doulas. So I train doulas, I've trained over 600 doulas now, I'm in the middle of a training right now. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing that we have an increased awareness and knowledge about doulas, but there are a couple of things that we must pay attention to. Number one, the community is confused. There are still people who do not understand that there is a major, major difference between midwives and doulas. They are not the same. And we must make sure that, yes, you need a doula and a midwife. You need a doula and an OB. And your doula should not be attending your home birth, just you and your doula. That's not their scope of practice. All right. So that's important. And so as we are empowering communities, I'm going to get a doula. They must understand that a doula is not a midwife. The other thing is the doula is not the golden ticket. Yes. We must change the system. And so now throughout the country, everywhere, let's reimburse doulas. Let's reimburse doulas. Sure. Let's reimburse doulas. Let's also fix the broken yes. system. Let's dismantle what is happening. Let us, because guess what? You can have the best doula in the world when she is walking into the medical industrial complex by your side. Trust and believe if she's not ready to go to war and you're not ready to go to war, the doula can't do nothing for you. You must, we must change the system. We must increase capacity at hospitals with nurses. Do y'all know how short staff these labor and delivery units are? Listen, you better tell us. Yes. Yes. And I'm talking about it's getting worse. I have been there. When I hear some of the cases of maternal mortality, all I can think about, I've only experienced one in my 30-year career. I experienced one in my first year of labor and delivery experience. There was one maternal mortality that I bear witness to. Since that time, I've experienced a few through friends, but never as a clinician. But when I tell you there were many nights or I worked night shifts, so there were many mornings that I went home giving thanks that nobody died last night while I was in the operating room with one person and I had another patient on Pitocin that nobody was watching and I had a third patient who was on mag sulfate that I wasn't even supposed to have and here we go, yes. Whoa. Oh, they want us to talk slower. We're from New Orleans, it's gonna be hard. We're gonna try though, we're gonna try. Slow it down. Slow and I get passionate. <laughs> Watch me. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. I apologize for the translators. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. Like, like, sign language, Spanish, all of the things. I apologize. Language um, justice. Language so justice sorry. in the house. And so I, I really, and I get so excited and passionate, mm -hmm. but there are so many stories that I've heard about and I listen to the story and I'm like, I was there, not physically, but I was there. I was that nurse. 
literally calling the doctor four times who's not answering the phone and the patient is bleeding out. I was there because you at the movies and you don't want to change the medication order. I was there when we should have had one patient because she was significantly high risk and we have called every single nurse available and no one will come in to help us and trust and believe in 2023 post COVID, it has not gotten better. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the problems that we are seeing, we have the racism issue, we have the incompetence issue, we have malpractice issue, and we have straight staffing issues. Yeah. I believe that if anybody wants to become a nurse, they should be able to go to school for free yeah. because we need to significantly increase capacity in our hospitals. And I will stop. No, that's perfect. So, and I'm going to try to talk more slowly because I'm sure I've been going too fast for the translators as well. And we're working on language justice. And as we talk on the prep call, so, so many things that y'all all said, but um, the, we, in order to, the first step we can do for me in my organization is to at least make my staff learn Spanish. And the re, especially if we're going to do international work, if we're talking about the African diaspora showing up in Colombia, showing up in Peru and be like, y'all got to help me. I don't know what y'all talking about is not really helpful for the people who are in that country. So we really important for us to have a much more, a much more broad understanding about speaking more slowly so that the translators can ensure that everybody has access to the information, ensuring that we are being equitable. So I'd love to hear about your work here in Puerto Rico and what you were doing and how we can be more supportive as a state of Black health. And as we think about ourselves, not as a just solely a US-based organization, but really Blackness is, a, is transnational. Definitely. Yes, I wanted to share, um, I wanted to pick up and some of the comments that you made about um, um, the status of staffing and working and the feminization of that work too. Because um, there are nurses, there are midwives, there's specific people that's doing this work, not only um, with a racial uh, lens, but with a gender lens. And, and they're not um, being centered in their needs and moving forward with what we need to do to support them. Um, but I wanted to share, at least from Puerto Rico, we have a 12% rate of premature rate, um, birth, birth rate. Um, an infant mortality uh, surrounding the 7%. The C-section rate, hear this out, 47.5%. Is our C section rate. Compared to the states, it's 26%. Um, 27, yeah, almost. There is no law protection or intention of protection um, for midwives. We only have an accompaniment law protecting doulas that we have to push to make it work. <laughs> because it's on paper, right? It's more on paper than what is on the everyday people's lives. Um, so doulas are not covered or midwives are not covered by private or public funding. It's out of pocket. You want these services, you will need out of pocket money for made the, the payment. And this is also true for abortion access. We only have four clinics. All of them are private. All of them are in the metropolitan area. So any person from Vieques, from Culebra, that doesn't have access to reproductive services needs to travel not only by ferry, but by car or bus um, to get to the metropolitan area to get basic service as worship. So I wanted to bring that in and to the, to the conversation, precisely because the work that we have been doing is visibility, is putting out um, a multi-level response in the community and a multi-directional response. Um, working with services, working with education, working with advocacy and organizing, and working with policy and research. I will tell you that 
um, because we don't have segregated data by race, we only have it by ethnicity. We have been pushing forward um, the development of programs, instruments, and research, participatory research projects where we can have a realistic overview of what are not only disparities, because we don't want to talk about disparities. We don't talk about disparities at all. That doesn't serve us at all. We talk about inequality and injustice. Because when you touch that, you talk about what is dignified and what is well-being, what is, is that aspiration, not the lacking of. And in inequality, we can do the storytelling of it. We can not only show you the data, we can have um, putting faces to that data. So that's how we have been trying to work with it. Um, building our own curriculum, some yes. community health workers, building our own curriculum, we're, um, dual, abortion doulas, moving towards full spectrum doulas, moving uh, forward on um, uplifting the black leadership of our community, um, making space for uh, younger and older people to get involved in reproductive justice and birthing justice as included. Um, as a reproductive justice fight, but knowing um, that is, this is not something that we want to keep as a legacy, is that we want to dismantle it and want to move forward, and we want to break the systems that perpetuate the way that we live um, unequally. Yes, I love um, it. So, and I wanted to make a comment on the joy. Yeah. Because we needed to um, feed from the joy pond a lot in this past five to six years. Because we had the hurricanes, we had the earthquakes, we had the COVID, <laughs> and then we have the control uh, supervision board imposed on Puerto Rico in 2016 by Obama. That makes all financial and fiscal decisions on budgetary matters in Puerto Rico. And it's not an elected official. Wow. Or States rights for Puerto Rico. So we need to talk about the integration of what we are, what we want to build for all for ourselves. So joy and vision. Be, be visionary, being a visionary of, of good life for our community needs to be centered to, not only to speak about what we need to fix or change or just disrupt, um, but intentionally saying we want to dream and we want to build it. Yes. And we can. That's so, so I, I love that. Share. Thank you so much. That's so beautiful. And so uh, this is going to be my last question. So if people want to start lining up, because I know y'all, I've been here a few times, y'all got questions. So think of them, get in line on the microphone and we're going to go to two and two. But so I just want to, um, one of the other things we've been working on and, and because of the work that I, I'm so blessed to do, the term preconception. So um, funny that we get from the Buffett anonymous, the fact that people call themselves anonymous because they're funding abortion, creates harm. So we can have a conversation about that anyway. But um, the idea that you're only valuable because you conceive, right? So when you when you peel back when the term preconception was made, it was made during around white supremacy, patriarchy, and violence. Like we should be able to be, to desire to, our bodies are not just built for conception. If we never choose to birth, we should be invested in. So how this plays out in the medical field as a physician. So my, my, my amazing friend, Dr. Yolanda Lawson is a closing panelist and she's a black woman OBGYN just like me. And she's the president of the National Medical Association. So I get a lot of pushback from my black women OBGYN friends that I talk about doulas and midwives and not black OBGYNs. And the truth is it's because we have not as a field, as medicine, confronted the racism inside of our field. Like we have not honored the same way that midwives and doulas have that is just, this is crazy racist, right? Like there's a lot of stuff happening. So when you think about how the term preconception was created, what the goal of it is, what the point of it is. So when it plays out that you can only get a Medicaid visit 
to take get a pap smear if you're talking about conception, not just if you want just to know that you don't have cervical cancer. This is how the policy, how the word becomes a policy that actually kills us across the United States. So just be clear that our language, we have to be clear about our own language. So we've been, so there's a, this fancy UCSF panel. We have a whole bunch of paperwork, Dr. Christine Glendorf, all about like patient-centered care. Like I, 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 there's a lot of research that, so I'm just saying that we're evolving because a goal, if their goal was harm, how do we turn their goal from harm to joy? So what we want is people who no matter if they want to be pregnant ever, I'm valuable if I never have a baby, I'm valuable because I exist, I would like a pap smear. How do we fund that? How do we fund our ability to live and to thrive? So what I hope that we can think about is how do we find joy in our work and what gives us joy? What makes us think about how we're going to build a future together? So anybody want to start off with what gives them joy? What makes them you know, think about what we could do to build together going forward as folks think about their questions from the audience? Whoever wants to start. I'll start. Um, we actually had this conversation um, at both of the organizations. I um, I hold a leadership role in. So I mentioned my work at Spark Reproductive Justice Now. I'm also the executive director of Breast Cancer Action, too, as well. I see them both as um, driving vehicles for how I do this work um, collectively within community. But um, internally, we discussed... Um, the importance of just like joy. Um, one, because most of the folks that are doing this work on the ground look like us, have our identities, and it's exhausting as all get out, right? Um, so to actively like hold our own personal experiences and then also be in community and do the work to dismantle, disrupt, rebuild, and also be involved in legislative session and legislators and all, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like doing that intentional work and then showing up in community to center community care, et cetera, is tiring to say the least, right? So like we integrate work, I mean, excuse me, joy in every aspect of it. If it's just like cracking some jokes, if it's like, you know, first off, black folks, we can find something funny in everything. Like we we will make fun of everything. We do, we will, you know, like, the dozens, we do that. Mama jokes, right. we got it all, right? Go ahead. Right. But I think it's also a part of our, it's, it's, it's a strategy for survival you know, um, the ways in which we have to integrate joy in our life, or we're just not going to survive. And I think that as we do this critical work to um, getting towards liberation and freedom, if we don't intersect joy, if we don't intersect um, self-care, rest, um, and, and really think about how we, um, th those both can exist in the same space, we can, we can navigate grief, loss, anger, harm, pain, history, et cetera, with also uplifting our joy, you know, as a, as a radical strategy for getting to freedom. And, um, and it's something we do individually and collectively within a community, right? Um, and I think as we continue to center that, it, it, it's okay to like center our happiness and our joy and put people on pause, put social media on pause, do whatever pausing you need to do to take care of yourself you're not going to be around to experience liberation and freedom when we get there, because we're going to get there. So if you don't take care of yourself, if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't show up for community. We can't show up for our loved ones, our families, our sibs, because we're not going to be around to experience it within ourselves. So I think we find every piece of a chance to have fun, like whatever it is, you know, um, dancing, music, what, what, what have you, right? You mentioned something too as well, like how you engage people um, because starting with like our experiences and our, it, it's sad, like, I don't even want to talk about my experiences up here, it's, you know, um, but um, the ways in which in community or within movement, especially the reproductive justice movement, we um, commune and build power is through our joy. You know, um, arts and culture and media and just like, I mean, going to a ball or doing whatever, like, you know, whatever just makes you feel filled in that moment is how we get through the next step and the next step and there for afterwards. So that's beautiful. Right um. I'll talk, uh, like give a couple of examples of what brings me joy in my work. First, I feel very privileged that I have been able to like, I have a, a business that was started by me, a single black woman with no business experience. I come out of medicine and here I am 12 years later, a successful business with three employees. So for me, that brings me joy because it lets me know that I'm serving my community in a way that they are continuing to uplift me. When I look at what I hear, 
or what we have heard about Black communities not supporting Black communities. When I tell you I've trained over 600 doulas, and I also say to you that like 90% of them are Black women, I'm like, oh no, we support each other. That gives me joy. What gives me joy is the little light bulbs that I see on social media when somebody tags me in a story and they say training tonight was everything. My life just changed. That brings me joy. When I'm at the art of birthing and there is a young man who gets up to participate in the open mic and he does a poem. Y'all, this is a true story and it blew me away. He does a poem about his mother dying during birth. And at the end of the thing, I am like, was that just creative license? Was that a real story? I did not know. It was creative license. He did not lose his mother. But because of me and because of a friend who knew me, he learned about, this was a young man, 20 something years old, no interest in pregnancy, no interest in having children, but he learned about maternal mortality so much so that he stood in front of this audience and gave this poem with details as though he literally had witnessed a maternal mortality. That let me know that I had changed his understanding. When I have an event and afterwards people come up to me and they say, you just changed my entire belief and understanding about what it is to experience pregnancy and birth for the better. That brings me joy. When I have a doula who lets me know that she supported a mother who up until 30 weeks had not literally been physically touched by the physician, literally had not been physically touched by the physician, but because of the support of this doula, she changed providers. And at 32 weeks, that's when she got nervous. Wait a minute, Kristen, the doctor touched me. Right. Is everything okay? Wait, what? <laughs> that brings me joy. Because what I know is they say, if you change one person, you've actually changed 10. If you touch one person and raise their awareness of something, you've done that for 10 people plus. So what I know is when that young man got on the stage, when that sister posted her post about how her life was changed, when that young girl got touched by the doctor and she realized that that's how it was supposed to be, I know that my work is doing that which it's supposed to be. I know that I am doing my work and moving on my path. And that continues to bring me joy and allows me to show up and to continue to share my story. Um, uh, I just wanted to say um, how to move forward. I think we have intentionally talked about the intergenerational dialogue and how important it is for us to do it um, on purpose um, and do it uh, in a planned way. Because we do it as a community, as a culture aspect of how we share uh, with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors. Um, but I think uh, from the health promoters that we say, or we always say we are the first community we have to take care of our first community and then we can expand. And then Puerto Rico is our community, right? Um, is that how we can, we maintain an intergenerational dialogue um, that is purposeful and that is um, integrated in everything that we do because we have lost a lot um, in movement, in this type of movement because of um, just maintaining their oral stories or just maintaining some communities um, literacy about our issues and our struggles and our strengths and how we survive it. And we have seen that in the new generations um, that are coming up in Loisa and in, in the East Coast of Puerto Rico. So I just wanted to put that one um, out there um, to do it intentionally is to do it better. It's not that we're not doing it, it's just to do it better. Um, and also, uh, I think that we, uh, we need uh, to continue making space for um, 
the lis listening, listening to move forward um, on what is good, what is desirable, what is meant for our community and not enter in this competitiveness of that we want, have one answer and one answer fits all for every community. Um, and I think that is about respect and that's about dignity and that's about um, really wanting to work as community and not as speakers of people. Um, so I think we have learned that in these past years um, and, and I think it's important um, for us to continue that work forward because we, we have so many narratives coming in and we need to be discussing them, um, dialoguing around them, um, but not assuming them as good, as perfect, and as applicable to me and to my community right now, just because you wanted to push your agenda. So we need to make agendas for ourselves and then make space for that agenda and to put people in the agenda to benefit from it. Um, um, so yeah, I wanted to, to put that because as you can see, we can talk about Puerto Rico realities for the whole day. <laughs> and um, I think those three things are um, where we are intention on the work. Oh, okay. So um, I will say what brings me joy. Joy was, joy has been a hard concept for me, like hanging my hat on joy because it almost made me feel like, well, we can't figure anything else out. So let's just talk about joy. Um, and it was, yeah, like it was just like, I didn't really know. I really struggled for the past year with joy and it wasn't until you know, we did the Nourish program, you know, I authentically moved forward with really not thinking of how I was trained in my PhD program, how I was trained, and just what I would say Western paradigm knowledge, and really saying, I'm just going to lean into what I know works. I'm going to lean into storytelling. I'm going to lean into ritual. I'm going to lean into some other things. And having, we started out with a cohort of 40, thinking that we would end up with 20, but 38 ended up graduating. And they, and they said, you know, I, for the first time, know what home feels like. And so when I heard that, I was like, ah, that's the joy right there. That is the joy and, um, you know, their parents coming to see them graduate. And, you know, when their graduation happened, it was supposed to be like a little program in the classroom, you know, like here's your certificate. But, you know, Morgan was like, this has been so impactful. And I was just like, we don't really have the money to put on like a huge graduation where you get a stole, et cetera, et cetera. And they said like, this is more important to me than my college degree, because this is gonna be the information that saves me, that saves my family, that saves my community. So please put on this graduation for us. <laughs> and so there was so much joy filled in that room with um, you know, many of them being from Puerto Rico, Mexico, um, other parts of the diaspora, Jamaica, Africa, and their parents coming up and saying, thank you for restoring our cultural knowledge. Like my child didn't believe in this stuff and by what you have bought to them, you know, they know that carrying a baby on the back has so many healing benefits, so many benefits for baby and mom. So just things like that really started to reinvigorate um, and restore my idea of joy. I will also just end with personally that those twins I lost, they came back. So I ended up pregnant seven years later with twins, um, boy, girl twins, and um, they were not supposed to make viability and they made it to 40 weeks. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's joy. That's, that's joy. That's yeah. joy. 
All right, so who, and I'll give mine while y'all, somebody, I know somebody has a question. Um, so, okay, you have to go to the mics, baby. There you go. Um, so the, uh, this past year and a half has been wild for me, right? Like once the road got overturned, my little organization, my life, my family, my husband works on reparations. I work on abortion. So let's just say, I tell people it's like if Malcolm and Martin were husband and wife, and like like everything about my life became turned upside down. And all I could think of to your ancestors and to the everything that y'all talked about, when I would check, speak to my elders, they were they were, of course y'all are getting harassed. You're Malcolm and Martin. Like this is how this works. And the joy of ancestral knowledge, the joy of a community that understands we are not tripping. Like we get that white supremacy is real. We get that they have been attacking us since they stole us from the shores of Africa. And so the joy of understanding of love, even in chaos even in confusion, that has been really powerful for me. So I just appreciate all of you here. And we're winning. Just always remember that we are winning. Ask Donald Trump. Okay, microphone one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much uh, to all of the panelists. Um, this was actually a full circle moment for me. Dr. Joya Creer was actually the uh, physician who delivered my second child. Yes. So I'm here from New Orleans. Uh, and so happy to see you represented and following your career all these years. She's now 19 years old. So um, I need pictures. You. Yes, I will. And so, you know, in your office, pregnant for the second time, very worried about being pregnant for the second time and saying, this is really just not a good time. And you looking at me and saying, you know what, it never really is. But you have to decide, is this what you want? Right. And so I thank you for that. Um, I'm now a mother of four and um, appreciate that moment. Um, and so I'm, I'm asking um, this because in my four pregnancies, four children, um, four different doctors, what I found was that relationship building with physicians, I didn't understand how it worked. And this is someone who uh, my father-in-law is an OBGYN, right? And so even being in a community and knowing other physicians and, and having access maybe that even others would not, I found that it was very difficult um, as a woman, then as a very young woman to um, understand how to make those decisions and connect with a physician that I would feel cared for. And so um, my question is to you, to the panel, what recommendations would you make uh, for building a relationship with a physician before becoming pregnant or soon after learning of pregnancy to ensure that our experiences are health affirming, dignified, safe, non-traumatic and joyful? I feel like I, so can I just take a privilege as moderator right quick, just for a second. So remind me your name, baby, because I really feel like I, I, I used to think I knew all my patients' names in my mind. I did at least. I'm sorry. I'm LaShonda Pickett, Renee. Yeah. From New Orleans. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Very nice to meet you all and great to see you again. Thank you again, baby. Uh, so I, I used to say, so we did studies that show patients want a trust building visit. And I was stunned by this because I thought if you made an appointment with me, that meant you trusted me. So when you come in, but the truth is, I know that's not true. I have two parents, my mother passed last year, but when I take my parents to doctors, I don't trust them. I made an appointment, you're a nephrologist, I'm gonna see what you're gonna say. So this idea, like this building a relationship, we inherently as physicians are taught that you, you're you here, so you must trust us, listen to what I say. And the fact is, I know as a black woman, as a person, as a human being, I don't just innately trust everything you say just because I walk in the room. And so that's really, to, we have to work on strategies to build trust. We are not trustworthy as physicians and we have built an entire system based upon patriarchy, white supremacy and all that general oppression. So we don't treat people well. So we have to do a better job um, of meeting you where you are. And so that's really, when I would talk to patients, I would say to them, I'm talking to you because you're a black woman like me and I get it, right? Like I know what's in your head, baby, I've been you. So I would just talk to you like my friend because you felt like my friend to me. So that's really what was easy for me to do, honestly. But that's not something, it's hard to train that. That's just who I am as a human being. I do that on this panel, right? So I'm just gonna be that human being. How do we get more human beings who are physicians who see other people as human beings? That is really a challenge, but go ahead. Now, I, I think that that's really the issue. It's not that we don't know how to build trust with providers. Providers don't know how to build trust with patients because it's not something that they're traditionally done. So to answer your question, and hello, New Orleans, okay? So uh, answer, <laughs> to answer your question, what I would say is when I, when I, when I do my trainings, 
I tell people that it is not about creating a birth plan. It's about learning how to cultivate communication. And so from day one, it is really, if, if, you, if the provider does have the space and time to have a quote trust building appointment, make that appointment and be very clear about this is why I'm here. It's important to know that a good gynecologist does not necessarily mean a good obstetrician. They are two different things. So understanding what you're looking for in that provider, what is it that you're getting clear? This is what will make me feel safe. This is what will make me feel joyful in my experience. This is how I want this experience to look. So then you go into the provider's office and you ask simple questions. So how long you be become personable? How long have you been an OB? Oh, how many babies have you caught? Have you caught any relatives? Start asking regular questions to take their guard down. There was an anesthesiologist that we used to work with who was always wrong. That's how he walked around the hospital. Um, he was also an attorney. So he was always moving with this just scrawl. So what I did as a new labor and delivery nurse, first of all, I was nuts when I was 21 flying. That was me. And um, whenever I saw him, I would say, hey, doc, how's the baby? Because he was an older father and he had like a three or four year old daughter. And every time I would see him, that's what I would do. So what did that do that completely took his guard down because his little girl was the apple of his eye. He would pull out pictures to show me and everybody would be like, how you talking? How, how you got that relationship with him? Girl, cause I ask about his baby every time I see him. I asked him about his baby every time. There was another uh, OBGYN I used to work with at a different hospital, mean and nasty, mean and nasty. In the operating room, I would be like, so how's the family? And I would smile because I need you to disarm yourself. I need you to remove this mask of superiority. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we have in common is we love our children. We love our mothers. We love our, you know, so that's something that I would do. So I would encourage people to just start asking questions. What med school did you go to? You might already know this. Right. Website. Right. But you're asking questions that will disarm them. And that makes them more human. Their humanness, get into their humanness, because unfortunately they are trained out of their humanness yes. in their medical school training. That's beautiful. And that's exactly what the patients ask for. They want to see that the, that the physician knows that they're human too. So they want to hear. So people knew all my business because there is New Orleans. So they knew I was human. How much time are we doing on time? I just, uh, okay, okay. So anybody else want to answer that before we move to another mic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just briefly, because I know somebody's waiting for a question, but I also wanted to add, I, I, um, we encourage the questions, um, but we have uh, to add on that, the perspective that after we have received uh, medical students as practitioners in our community center, they rotate and they do certain weeks. We have also pushed an agenda is that they need to change their ways of treating people. And it's a two way street with the patient-doctor relation. Um, so also we need to get better at what to ask, how to ask, um, get empowered to ask for it. But we also need um, system change in how we are training to be not only doctors, but just to have any profession where we deal with people in vulnerable states with doubts, with questions. And it's like, sometimes you go to the doctor and you're like, you don't know, even know if you can ask a question because you, in this system that we are living in, you have three to 10 minutes for a consult. Yes. So pick your questions wisely because <laughs> you have to see the next patient. You have to see the next patient because that is it's what, uh, that's the system that we have lived in, right? So I also just wanted to bring that uh, we have always, um, in recent years, have more um, medical students rotate and do community work. And we have seen how that works with uh, their sensibilization and their change. Like um, how I'm gonna do this consult, how much time I have to for this consult how many questions I'm gonna ask just 
to change For that sure. mindset that this is not transactional. Yes. I'm taking I'm taking a decision that is going to impact the rest of my life. Yes. Probably in your office, in your five to 10 minutes that you have to give me. So it, it, it needs to be meaningful. Can I add okay. just one quick thing to that too as well? Um, so just speaking about the medical industrial complex, which I believe was lift, uplifted here too as well and how it's wrapped in just white supremacy and capitalism, capitalism with productivity, et cetera, right? Um, and then speaking about cultural culturally humble care like cultural competency and well, this humility that, is like, a fancy yeah, term some yeah. black doctors made that up yes <laughs> being culturally humble in every aspect of care um seeking a provider that understands the colonial imposition that is gender that is medicine that is race that is a separate right um but one thing i wanted to add was that we're we're talking as if like everyone has equitable access to a provider, right? Like there, especially in Georgia and other uh, southern states, there are those very deep rural areas where you don't have the choice of a provider or have a provider or fall within that gap of coverage, right? So I think there's privilege in that too as well, you know. Um, so just uplifting the folks that one don't have equitable access to even identify a provider. And even if we get into the office or, you know, a clinic with a provider, let's say, you know, it's accessible financially and also ge geographically, like, you know, walkability, built environments, et cetera, right? Like there's all these different barriers that affects our ability to access equitable care, right? Then equity also includes having a provider who's culturally humble. Like that's, I mean, that's something we can only dream of, you know? Um, so, that allows you to start building that relationship and such, right? Because if I'm accessing a provider, I know you're problematic. I live in this very racist, small town. I'm not going to want to know about your kids. Like, I'm not going to want you to know about, exactly. you know, et cetera, right? You have high C-section um, rates because I'm not going to sit there in the hospital with you. Exactly. And um, so I think, you know, just uplifting those small pockets of communities too as well that just access looks different for all of us, right? Um, and I don't have a solution for how you build relationships in those hostile, hurtful environments, you know, because right now in that environment, I'm just trying to survive and make sure if I decide to carry yep. that this child survives too as well. So you're kind of like in fight or flight mode in those in those situations. So I just also just wanted to uplift that too as well because it, it changes with it does. Privilege. I mean I having I had so um my dad was in New Orleans but my mama was in Grambling. Any HBCU people here? So I'm, I'm a townie, right? So it's rural Louisiana. I had my first child in a hospital, Lincoln General, where my mother was the pharmacist and everybody loved Miss Carolyn because she was so nice. But your, but the truth, they liked my mother. So I was treated well because my mother was the black pharmacist at the hospital. When my friends would go to the same doctor, they wouldn't get and they wouldn't get an epidural. They wouldn't get I had so like being able to see us as fully human despite your assumptions about who we are and where we live is just so important. And I tell people the American healthcare system got rid of Eastern medicine and made up this thing called Western medicine. And so we got rid of this spirituality, this connection to indigenous ways, like all these things. So this is why we have the outcomes that we have. And until we really go back to understanding that our, that you can burn sage in the, in the delivery room and that ain't gonna kill the baby. Like it's just important for us to remember that we come from an indigenous tradition, a global transnational tradition that's tied to our, our roots. All right, so microphone. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll save it for time. But as a father of three, my wife and I had a beautiful daughter, two beautiful twin boys. So shout out to twin life. Um, but we had an, a positive outcome due to this woman right here, Tina Roberts, who helped us get connected with the doula. Um, and my question really goes to in my role, I oversee my brother's keeper, Sacramento affiliated with the Obama Foundation, Sierra Health Foundation, all across the nation. But for this specific conversation and a lot of the young men that I speak to, I'm interested to hear if you could share any experiences or practices that you've implemented to include men, um, spouses, or partners to support positive maternal health outcomes when we're speaking in this regard. Yeah, so we've... Um... I think, yeah, we, we definitely, um, you know, on college campuses, we have conversations where we invite, you know, college men or whoever to be a part of those conversations to understand the importance of um, 
we can't do this alone. This is not like a woman's issue or, um, you know, a cis woman's issue. It's, it's really everybody's issue. Right. Um, and so I think I've, I've found that dads, first of all, as doulas, if you are whoever's a doula in the room, we know that when we make dad shine, like we've, we've won because the dad has to go home with the family. We don't go home, dad go home. So dad's got to shine. So that's just intentionally a part of our practice, but we're finding, um, I work with a male doula. So we're finding that more men want to become doulas. They want to show other men, but also um, women and support them. They want, they want to, there is a yearning right now and a movement, as you just mentioned, to make sure that when they're in the room, because they're often, you know, disrespected, or we find that when couples are in the room, you know, the doctor may turn their, their body, right, to mom and not talk to dad. So dads are wanting to know how to advocate for themselves, how to make sure you're talking to both of us, how to make sure they're asking the right questions. And um, that's not just dads, it's brothers, it's uncles, it's friends, right? So we're finding that in our next you know, cohort of our Nourish program, we're going to make more space for those conversations to happen and more space for men to be a part of that. We um, we even have a male lactation specialist that's a part of VWHI as well. So just, um, just building those conversations and making sure we are making it a family issue. You know, birth work is family work. It's not women's work. It's not, um, it, it birth, it's, it's family work. And so we want to make sure that that is that happens and that we're expanding those conversations. We also had a whole panel and webinar just of men that are in the birth space and are in non-traditional birth spaces that are usually taken up by um, by women. So we thank you for that question. We, we are doing more to like bring that to the forefront and it's very important that we um, make sure that we're included of the entire community in this conversation. So I appreciate that. And I, so I'm old enough to have been with the My Brother's Keeper when Damon was over it and we were, we were having all the meetings and we would fight about this because philanthropy funds black men and boys for mentorship and jail to prison pipeline. They fund black women and girls for our uteruses and abortion. So until we can see that philanthropy stops separating us and say, we're only worried about black men and boys going to jail and we're worried about black women and girls uteruses, we can't fix the system. So I'm hopeful that the Obama Foundation will help us because I love my president, forever president, Dr. Uh, Obama, that he they can help us to not just see, only see black men and boys as gangbangers and black women and girls as uteruses that have babies. Oh, sorry. And I, I, would, I would just say that with the work that we do, we are, I'm always working to get myself more educated on men being connected to the work and training my doulas when I train them, there's always a fatherhood piece. And this year at the Auto Birth, and we're actually showing it is a 10 year old documentary, but plenty of people have never seen it called the Black Fatherhood Project. And it'll be an all male panel to just really continuing elevating this idea that this is a community issue. This is a family issue. And I often talk about some of the best community-based conversations I've ever had is with grandpas. Ooh, Them yeah. grandpas, they want to know they do. why they babies can't have babies like back in the day when we used to have our babies. Like it's a, I love talking to grandpas. Yes. And so I, I really try to um, make those connections as much as possible. I think, and so I know we're at time, but I just, one last, you've been standing there so patient. Can you just quickly, what were your statement is? Hi, thank you so much um, for my question. I'm sorry, there's been a lot of chatter. Can we please quiet down and respect these speakers? Thank you. Now my question. Um, so y'all earlier spoke about just like doulas and um, maybe like getting, I don't know, state support for like doula help. Um, and in this work, I've worked with a lot of folks who are trying to get like certification for doulas and things like that. My concern with that is sometimes with things like that, um, certification, state, like legitimacy, things like that, that often Preach. comes with like a lot of barriers for folks to get into that work. So how would y'all, I guess, if you could speak to that? So I, I, I'll just be quick that if you self-regulate, so we don't need doctors and nursing regulating doulas. So doulas know each other. The doulas can take care of each other. So doulas should certify themselves and not have us overseeing them, which is every legislation says a nurse should oversee it or a doctor. And that's how we get patriarchy and white supremacy. And, and so last, you agree? 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I, was, I, I would just add that very good point because if we do go on this road of trying to standardize doula practices, we're recreating history and we're doing the same thing that we did with midwives. So like, man, well, let me tell y'all something. I'm so sorry. This has been my soapbox since I trained my first doulas in 2013. Y'all worried about being certified. Y'all worried about getting reimbursed by the state. Now it is happening. It has already happened. The train has already left the station. And in state after state after state, hospital after hospital, they are shifting policies around certification and reimbursement. And primarily, we are being left out. So what I say to my doulas and to anyone who is trained with an organization that is not a large white organization, get involved in the, now that y'all, the train has left the station. Let me be very clear. And so now that it has, we must ensure that we are at the table in every conversation so that when the state of Louisiana says that they will reimburse donor, right. that they also say they will reimburse Sister Midwife Productions yes. and Shafia Monroe right. and Ancient Song Doulas and whoever y'all, whatever y'all are called. Like we have to make sure when Walmart says that they are reimbursing doulas, it cannot just be from Dona and National Black Doulas Association. It must be from every grassroots Black doula training agency. And we need y'all who have been trained by us to sit to the tables to make sure that it happens. Mm -hmm. I did not want it to happen. I saw the writing on the wall. I know the history of the Shepherd Towners Act and what it has done to Black maternal health care. It is repeating itself. Mm -hmm. Cause y'all wanted it. So, so thank y'all so much for dealing for, for being patient with us. And we appreciate